Style Slicks, a Q&A spotlight on notable Southern style disruptors who made game-changing career moves in fashion, design, art, architecture, music, cinema, sports, and culinary arts. First up, the Atlanta creative scene. Gail O'Neill, journalist, producer, host, former model. Hi, my name is Gail O'Neill. I have had many careers as a salesperson for the Xerox Corporation, as a model, as a TV host and writer, producer, as a writer about arts and culture for Arts ATL, and finally as host of a new series called Collective Knowledge. My definition of style is the outward expression of internal values. So whether that's the way you dressed, not to be confused with consumerism, but what expresses your values inside, whether it's the way you treat people, the way that you host other people, the way that you conduct yourself in life, all reflect a personal style. Has my personal definition of style changed over the years? Absolutely. I started off with no style. Basically, it was dictated to me, I guess like most people. I grew up going to Catholic schools from the age of 7 to 17, and so I had to wear a school uniform, which was fine with me. It meant I didn't have to make any decisions, I didn't have any choices, and frankly, I didn't have a point of view, so that was okay. And then through university, I guess basically looking like somebody who did not have style and who didn't care about such things, I was focused on my studies. I think I started to have a sense of aesthetics and how important they were when I started modeling. Not because of the clothes I was wearing, but because of the sensibilities of the people who surrounded me. Photographers, wardrobe stylists, hair and makeup artists, art directors, all of whom had very, very distinct points of view and who were never too afraid to express them. Verbally, loudly, and frequently. <laughs> Do I feel like I've experienced success in my career? I feel like the Forrest Gump of media. I stumbled into a modeling career when a photographer discovered me at JFK Airport after a red-eye flight from the West Coast to New York early one morning. I stumbled into a career in media bro in broadcast journalism with CBS News when the director, the news director, asked me to come in for like a five, ten minute meeting and the next thing I knew I was anchoring these frothy little features reports every Friday night for CBS News in New York uh, talking about Broadway openings or theater openings or film openings. I stumbled into another career with CNN when they needed a new host for their Travel Now series. I stumbled, what was my, I stumbled into HGTV hosting Mission Organization when I had not even heard of the network and only took the job when my girlfriend said, you better take that job because I'm addicted to that, to that network and I want to see you on TV again. And then I stumbled into a career in real estate when I was asked to be one of two sales managers for what is now known as One Museum Place in Midtown Atlanta. The, um, the developer said, you don't have to know anything about sales, I just want you to understand storytelling and have a sense of style. Ta-da! And then I stumbled into my career of writing about the arts and culture when after the real estate bubble burst, right when I got my real estate license, um, my husband said to me, honey, you're going to have to figure out what your next great adventure will be. Life doesn't just happen with things you stumbling into these careers, so figure out what you want to do. He bought me a laptop, I started a blog that led to me writing for Arts ATL, and that's where I remain. I think it's been seven years now. And um, the last thing I didn't really stumble into, hosting and co-producing a series called Collective Knowledge with my wonderful filmmaker partner, Felipe Barral. The catalyst for every single career pivot has been dumb luck and a willingness to say, yeah, I can do that, even if I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I knew that I would study hard, I knew that I'm a quick study, I knew that I would learn fast, and I knew that I would not embarrass myself because that's something I, I just cannot do. So it was really dumb luck and a willingness to say, okay, I can try that. From career to career, my transferable skill sets have been my curiosity, my, I would say my humility, a willing to sit back and learn from people who know what they're doing, my willingness to try even when I had to maybe fake it 
I remember on my very first modeling job, seeing Betty Largo, who was like a huge, beautiful Brazilian beauty, doing a, a modeling shoot for the New York Times, Fashion of the Times. And I sat there thinking, there is no way in hell I can do this. But then another part of my brain clicked in and said, you can either do this or you can go back to selling copier machines for Xerox. You make the choice. And I did it. And it launched a 10-year career that took me around the world, had me on catwalks around the world, had me on magazine covers, and the representative for Revlon, Clairol, CoverGirl. It just, it exploded my world. And that's been, that's been my experience throughout my whole career. What do I consider my biggest challenge? Uh, my husband would say my aversion to change, which is pretty ironic for somebody who has had to keep changing careers so frequently and who is constantly auditioning for the next big adventure. It, uh, the opportunities come, but then I have, to make it, I have to make it take flight. So that would be the challenge. I really don't like change. He's absolutely correct when he says that. Okay, first of all, I'm not a millennial, so I don't consider myself someone who has a brand. But if it is, if I did have a brand and if it were fashionable, I would say the complete lack of artifice, the sincerity, and the what you see is what you get. I, I, I really, I cannot fake it, no. Oh, I think the mood of the country always affects style. If you think about how women dressed during the Great Depression, calico fabrics, very drab, nondescript, non-flattering non, non silhouettes for women, to the, to the explosion in luxury and, and fabrics and, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, femininity, post-World War II. Think of Dior's silhouette for women. A little nipped waist, fabric that just went on for yards and yards and yards, crinoline that in, that boosted the volume of women's skirts and so on, the exaggeration of femininity. Um, 90s grunge and I don't give a damn who cares about how I look. The 1980s when shoulder pads could not be big enough, poofs could not be poofy enough and so on. It'll be interesting to see where we go post pandemic. Will we be more pragmatic, in more pragmatic in style? Or will there be another explosion of too much is just not enough because we have been deprived Although I gotta say, I really do like wearing my sweats and my Lululemons and my ath athleisure wear in the confines of my home. I have loved not having to wear a bra, not having to do hair and makeup, and not having to wear heels these past nine months. Loved it. What was my funniest career moment? Um, well, maybe not funny, but eye-opening in a way that would not have, have happened otherwise. I was in Paris on my very first shoot for British Vogue. I was on my way to pinup studio in Paris. And as, we were, as I was rolling down the road, down the street, we were at a stop sign. There was, I was in a, a car. And at the stop sign, I glanced to my right and saw, recognized the top of the head of my favorite English professor, Robert O'Mealy. He was my English professor at Wesleyan University. And he had been in Paris on sabbatical, which I didn't know. So imagine a girl from New York who's rolling through the streets of Paris, glancing like, that's Mr. O'Mealy. So I say, I ask the driver to please stop. I leap out of the car. I dash into the, into the cafe, Mr. O'Mealy, and I startle him. He's there right, he's a writer, and he was there writing it. You know, he, he startles and he looks up, Gail, what are you doing here? And we reconnect and we chat for a little while. And then he walks me outside and he looks at the car, which is a stretch Mercedes Benz. And he looked at the car, and he looked at me, and then he looked at the car, and he said, well, all right. And in that moment, I came to understand how special it was. Uh, you know how they tell brides, enjoy every minute of the day because you don't want to look back and not remember it or say that it went by in a blur? I think I would, that career and that, that moment would have gone by in a blur had I not seen it in Mr. O'Mealy's eyes. And so I thank him. In fact, I just recently told him that story, and I thank him for opening my eyes and getting me to see how special it was. Do I have a biggest failure? Mm -hmm. You'd have to ask my husband. I'm sure I do, but I don't, I don't dwell on failure. This is the truth. Yeah, I've been fired many times. I've been fired by the best in the business, but I pick myself up and I move on. I never let a rejection or a change in, um, a change in the mood or the cha a change in the atmosphere determine my sense of self-worth. So this, this business is made up of constant rejection. 
and it's critical that you not take those rejections personally but that you take you you just gather whatever lessons you've learned in job one and you have it inform you in job number two and that you not repeat mistakes and maintain your confidence yeah. did I just tell the whole world I've been fired many times it's true <laughs> I measure success by a sense of gratification, a sense of waking up in the morning either giggling or ready to leap out of that bed to get to what you have to do. So whether you're making big bank by doing that or just having a sense of purpose and a sense of being able to contribute and a sense of excitement, that is my measure of success. I was balling when I was a model. I mean, that, that money was, I would get my paychecks and think, really? And um, the paychecks have gone down. You know, writing about the arts is basically a nonprofit endeavor, but the sense of gratification and excitement has only increased as time has gone on. So I, yeah. Mm -hmm. What advice would I give to someone at the tipping point of a career change? Oh, emulate the person you want to be with humility. Ask questions with humility. Stay curious um, and be bold, be bold, yeah. If I could do anything I wanted to do right now, I would wave a magic wand, this pandemic would be over, people would be well, I could rush out and hug all the friends I love who I haven't seen in nine months, all the family, I would have my buddies Scott and Keith come over so we could watch The Crown, eat Twizzlers, gummy bears, and have Keith shushing me and Scott while we were talking to the screen and he's trying to listen. I, I just, um, I would embrace joy, which I always have done, and I would embrace my friends extra, extra tight. Think of someone you consider a role model. What is it about them that inspires respect and admiration? While it's easy to identify the people we want to emulate, trying to duplicate the habits, disciplines, and daily practices that lead to their successes can be far more problematic because they tend to be instinctive and unspoken. I'm Gail O'Neill, the host of Collective Knowledge. Join me and my producer, Felipe Barral, for a series of half-hour conversations with artists, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders talking about the big ideas that make them tick. By acknowledging excellence and celebrating achievement in others, we at Collective Knowledge hope to remind viewers of their own potential for greatness, because spreading knowledge is the most altruistic thing we can do as human beings. Coming to you May 16th with a new episode premiering every Thursday.